There's been an entire cottage industry that has sprung up around teaching people how to innovate. Some of them are, are glib talks around, if you follow this process, you'll be innovative, or if you have a chief investment officer, or in my case, I gave a bunch of talks around, you should buy engineers and give them a day a week to be creative. That was glib too. We were all overly simplistic. We thought we could make innovation happen with one little thing. They were all wrong. We were all wrong because innovation is not the goal. The goal is to win. Winning means coming up with new products, coming up with new pricing, all the, all the small changes we can make, which are all innovations. But it's not about innovating. I was wrong. I talked about the innovation was the point. It's not. And when you step back and say winning is the goal, you give yourself a much broader range of things to think about. You can think about the way your strategy relates, what problems you're solving. You can talk about the structure of your organization and what should that structure look like. And you can talk about experimentation and things that you should try to figure out about your customers. Those are much broader, more applicable ways to try and win. It's not innovation, it's winning. So there's a lot of social psychology research that says if you incentivize someone to do a behavior they wanted to do anyway, you actually reduce their interest in doing it. So if you're already incented and you really enjoy and you love interviewing people and getting inside their brain, if I pay you extra to do it, you will become less interested. So what that means is when you design incentives for people, you need to think very carefully about what different possible incentives are. Money is only one. Recognition is another. So there's lots of businesses where the primary incentive beyond sort of basic salary is t-shirts. Early on at Google, one of the things people loved was we had lots of t-shirts lying around and everyone loved them. That was a really material incentive. Material being a small amount of a pun there, but it's okay. It was a material incentive because people were there because they believed in what we were doing. Most incentives start and end with finances, which is inherently bad for the workers you care the most about. You're already seeing major brands refocus their spending from traditional media into online media. For example, Gucci has been moving a lot of its spend. Uh, they're obviously still going to do broadcast uh, it, advertising. Branding is partially driven by reach and frequency. But on the other hand, many people are realizing that branding is maybe not the primary goal of advertising and PR. Instead, the primary goal of advertising and PR is to get people to buy something. Okay? I mean, and that sounds crass, but we're all in the business to do business. And I think as that trend continues, people will continue to focus on measurable advertising and measurable PR, trying to understand what the benefits are and what actually happened. And I think as that trend continues, you will see an increasing shift towards online advertising because it's simpler to measure. Anyone who says broadcast media is dead or you know, traditional branding ads are dead, it's just not paying attention. Clearly they're not dead. But probably they move from the vast lion's majority of spending to either less majority like, you know, or, or even maybe less than 50%. Hard to say, I'm not a futurist. But it's very clear that measurable advertising and, and advertising that drives an actual outcome has got to be better for companies, their shareholders, et cetera, than advertising, which simply does branding and is very distal from an event. I'm not an expert in that field, so my answer is necessarily pretty broad. But one of the things that places like this do well is figure out, they find customers and try to qualify them. And there's really interesting innovation being done here around ways to qualify leads. That is, I think, clearly an incredibly important part of measurable business. A mix of online and offline, these guys are obviously spending their time trying to figure that out. So the music industry is struggling right now, but they're not struggling for the reasons everyone thinks they're struggling. So in the early or the late 1990s, Steve Miller band sold several million copies of their greatest hits volume two. I didn't know there were two volumes worth of, Stephen, of, of, of Steve Miller band. Great band, but I didn't realize there were two greatest hits volumes. In contrast, in 2007, the best-selling album of that year sold fewer copies than the year that Steve Miller sold his second greatest hits volume two. So the industry is in meltdown. And, and if you ask industry people, they'll say, oh, we're in meltdown because of peer-to-peer -peer file sharing. Problem is that's not true. If you look at the data, 
for LimeWire, one of the largest peer-to-peer -peer networks, you see that the highest LimeWire users are also the highest purchasers of music. They spend more, they spend a lot of time on LimeWire finding music and they spend a lot of money buying it. That doesn't seem like theft. That seems like marketing. Try before you buy. And so, in some sense, the music industry has lost a trick by not figuring out ways to do deals with LimeWire, et cetera, as opposed to suing them. And I understand how they got to the suits. You know, it's a kind of a clear set of steps that get you there, but it's probably missing a trick where maybe there'd be an opportunity to use that as a marketing outlet. Who, who knows what will happen over the next few years, but that's an example of where the industry actually has great hope. The music industry is growing. There's great artists, you know, great marketing campaigns. It's an, still an amazing industry, but they need to figure out what marketing looks like in this new world.